Okay. Um, this time last year, I was working at Lloyd's Banking Group and working in design operations. I was feeling great. I started my regular day working from home in just my regular fashion. I had my big Starbucks coffee mug with my coffee, with my hazelnut milk in it. I go into my study, open the blind, sit down, take a sip, and turn on my laptop. And then I hear this sound. Ding! Notification, Outlook email. Title, business update. Another one coming, ping! Laurent slash Philippe one to one. Philippe was our director of design operation at the time. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> I've been long enough in this game to know that business update <laughs> is another word for restructure announcement. And if you are lucky, or in my case, unlucky enough to have a one-to-one -one with your director beforehand, it means usually you're in trouble, okay? And there I was. After 12 and a half years of service at Lloyd's Banking Group, I was being made redundant. And it hit like a slap in the face. I actually had other memes for slaps in the face. I was thinking of like the iconic memes. And obviously there's this one. Oh, oh, oh. this is an iconic one. Uh, I had others, but um, you know, we can come back to this later. Um, so it hit like a slap in the face. And the funny thing was that a year before that was the aftermath of COVID, January 2021. And there was, uh, you know, layoffs taking place at that time. About 40 designers in our team of about like 350 had lost their jobs. And at the time, I was running an internal blog, I was writing, and I was thinking, how can I write something and try and give some encouragement or some support to people who have been laid off and turn this negative into a positive? And I ended up the blog post with this quote. Every time I thought I was being rejected from something good, I was actually being redirected towards something better. Is it true? Yeah. Is it true? Of course it's true. But also, it's very easy to be in my position at the time. I was being safe, and I was giving advice to other people. It's easy to give advice when you're not in this situation. And so this time, I had to go and test my own medicine. I was going to have to go and see if this quote was actually true. And at first, it did not, didn't pan out this way. Rejection after rejection after rejection. And so, when Cleese call, called me and said, Laurent, the feedback's been fantastic, and we'd like to offer you the job, I was like, yes, I was really happy. I was ecstatic. I was also a bit apprehensive, because I had spent 12 and a half years working for the same company. That is, another KPI, 32% of my life I had been employed at Lloyd's Banking Group, right? So, I had this nagging question in the back of my head. Have I become institutionalized? Have I gradually become less able to think and act independently because of having lived for a long time under the rules of an institution? And so I was really aware of this and I wanted to avoid any pitfalls moving into an, an, a new organization because I hadn't done this in more than a decade. And so I read this book, The First 90 Days, that many of you probably know about, but it was incredibly useful. Subtitle, Proven Strategy for Getting Up to Speed Faster and Smarter. The premise of the book is very simple. Every time you're moving to a new role inside or outside your organization, you are in a transition period. And what worked in your current role will not necessarily <laughs> work in your new role, okay? And if you compare Lloyd's and Clay's Core, the two companies are very different. <laughs> a bit like this. So in terms of history, Lloyd's has been around for 250 years. Clay's Core was founded eight years ago. In terms of income, 16,324 million pounds revenue in 2021 compared to 74. 
65,000 employees, 450. Design, 350 to 50. And of course, a 30 plus design of department with design system, uh, storytelling team, uh, research operation, people and capability, and a team of one, me. <laughs> so I had to go through this process of unlearning and relearning. So today what I want to share with you is why unlearning is essential in transition and managing this transition. I'll give you some detail about my first 90 day plans uh, and also tools, tips and reflection along the way. But first let's explore unlearning. So what I want you to do is put your devices down and I want you to cross your arms. Now I want you to uncross them and cross them the other way. How does it feel? <laughs> Weird? Uncomfortable? It takes some effort, right? Imagine if you had to like relearn how to cross your arms automatically in the, the other way around, right? You would need to put your mind to it and you know, it would be an active choice that you, that you, that you would make, right? So that's what unlearning is about. So let's get now into a definition of unlearning. Where do you go when you want to look for your definition? Where do you go? No, that's so last year, ChatGPT. Google, that's old school, ChatGPT. ChatGPT. Right, so unlearning refers to the process of letting go of existing beliefs, habits, and assumptions that no longer serve us, or that may be hindering our personal or professional growth. It involves challenging our mental models and re-examining our biases, prejudices, and preconceptions. Unlearning is often necessary when we encounter new information or experiences that challenge our existing ways of thinking, and we need to adjust our beliefs and behaviors accordingly. It is an active and intentional process that requires a willingness to reflect on our assumptions, seek out new information and experiment with new ways of thinking and acting. Ultimately, unlearning can lead to personal growth and positive change both for individuals and organizations. So how do you go about unlearning? There are three stages of unlearning. And the first stage is acceptance. So uh, in this stage, uh, you really need to um, be aware that the behavior, your beliefs, your value system that you had are, have become problematic and needs to be changed because they're no longer effective or useful in a different context. In a different context. So you need to accept that. I had come to this acceptance because I was well aware of my tenure at Lloyd's. The second step is finding new sources of learning. So this is really the exploration and experimentation, experimentation stage where you purposely try to find opportunities to learn through new experiences. This was put upon me, so I didn't have to go and find it. I had, you know, I had no choice, so I was put in that situation. But the, the, the key here is to be curious and open to new perspectives. And then finally, the last stage is to recognize the sign. You have to pay attention to the patterns, the habits, uh, your ways of thinking that you have you know, built over years and find ways of breaking them so you can learn new ways, assimilate them, and then turn them into new behaviors. Okay? So that's, that's how it turns out. So how do you go about recognizing the signs? So there are different ways you can do this. So the first one is obviously listening to what's happening around you, uh, purposefully uh, trying to identify different ways of thinking or information that contradict your existing beliefs. The second one is you know, getting feedback from the way you communicate. So um, for instance, every time I put out a personal perspective or promoted an initiative in our channels, I was then looking for the reactions as a way of validating or invalidating whether something would resonate. That's the way of like challenging 
you know, my thinking and seeing if it's still applicable in this new context. Third thing, which I'm really into at the moment, is understanding body language. So when you talk about your role, or an initiative, or your belief, identify like, the micro expressions uh, <coughs> from the people you are engaging in conversation with. Uh, this is Vanessa Van Edwards. She's my favorite author right now. She's must, you know, if you want to learn more about people's skills and influencing people and body language, you can go to scienceofpeople.com. And she also has a book called Cues, which is incredible to really understand body language. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, and then the last one is, of course, your one-to-one -one with your manager, where you calibrate your thinking and trying to get feedback. Bonus. Uh, a couple of friends of mine have set up our own desktop support group, and so every two weeks we talk about the work that's happening, some of our challenges, and it's a good way of you know, challenging your own thinking, learning from new perspectives, uh, and it's been really invaluable for me. So if you don't have one, I would recommend you create one. So uh, let's talk a bit about the things I had to unlearn. So I had to unlearn some of the habits, so f uh, for instance, how to collaborate, uh, big org, uh, heavily regulated, was very risk averse. So the way I collaborated before, I tended to try and include or involve more or less everyone in you know a project or decision that, need, that needed to be made and get endorsement from your director because you know we don't want to rock the boat, blah blah blah. Um, and so in this new organization, there's more of like a bias towards action, and even sometimes having to make decisions with what felt for me like insufficient information. So that's one thing I had to unlearn. Another thing I had to unlearn was how to communicate, which was quite formal in my previous context. Um, and the channels that we use, or the medium that we use, were very different. Email, PowerPoint presentation, and in this new context, being like more informal, to the point, you don't have a PowerPoint presentation, you have a living document in Notion that can change at any time. Uh, but also, you expect it to express your point of view more strongly. And it's okay if something doesn't work out, but the speed of change is much faster. And of course, I had to up my game when it comes to emojis. <laughs> um, perhaps the biggest one to unlearn was beliefs. And this one was the belief to fight for design to be recognized. Who thinks it's part of their role? They have to increase the awareness of the value of design and fight for design to be recognized. Raise your hand. Of course. It feels good because it gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us a mission. It gives us something to cling on to as designers. We want to prove others that we can do things better, that we have a you know, different way of working, and it drives us. Well, this company, the CEO talks about the importance of design. And actually, the way we are set up as a triad across design, engineering, and product is we actually mean it when we say it. Not like, oh yeah, design is an equal part and blah, blah, and in reality, it's not the case. Here, it is the case. At the mission level or at squad level, you have a triad uh, of leadership, and that triad is accountable together for the decisions that are being made or the strategies or the outcome. So that was an assumption that I had to unlearn. And lastly, I had to unlearn how to use a Windows PC and move to Mac. <laughs> and eventually, you know, you can't unlearn every, anything, everything, right? So after two weeks, I had enough, like, give me my PC back because I can't deal with using a Mac, okay? So some stuff you just can't unlearn. Um, <laughs> That's not me, you know, it's just a picture from the internet. Um, <laughs> I didn't actually do this. It would cost me too much money to pay the company back. Um, okay, so I was in this situation, and so I set up my 90-day plan to learn about all of this. So uh, this is essentially the premise of the book I showed you earlier. In the first 30 days, you do your listening tour, you diagnose the issues. Then the second 30 days, you try and deliver some early wins to build credibility and continue learning about the organization. And then eventually you get to two strategic initiatives 
they will deliver higher value. So um, you're talking about three Ps. I raise you and I say five Ps. <laughs> and it starts with purpose. So this was basically the framework I used to think and theme my listening tool, OK? So purpose, what is the purpose of the design team here? What are we trying to achieve? And uh, you know, how do we measure progress against our purpose? Because this purpose is core to our motivation as designers. Second is people. How do we go about building a diverse, skill complete team that grow their skills in their career and have hum deep human connections? <coughs> process, what are the ca what's the cadence and the rituals? Uh, how was the process for resourcing, intake of work, prioritization, onboarding, offboarding, midboarding, whatever? And then platforms, tools and templates that enable us to do our job more efficiently. And then practice. Because one thing we haven't talked too much about today is practice. How does design up support effective, high quality design in also a way that is efficient and we take the picture, uh, <laughs> deliver <laughs> on business outcomes. So uh, these are the questions I put in my learning plan. So for another one for the, for the cameras. So these are the questions I wanted to get answers to as part of my listening to. So in purpose, what's the purpose of the team? Is it shared and understood across the organization? How do we measure progress against it? Process. All the things I talked about earlier, including what are the pain points. So this is why you know my service design skills come in really handy. Thinking about front and backstage um, and all that kind of stuff. People, how engaged the team are, are they learning and growing? Are one-to-ones happening? Are they effective? How do we manage talent? Are they performing? You know what supports do they need? Uh, and then platform, which is all about tools and how we use them and is it efficient and do they deliver ROI. And in practice, what's our design process? You know, what's our, our practices? What are the skills in the team? What's our design quality? I really want to measure or find a way of defining design quality. I haven't tackled that yet. So if you have any ideas, that'd be really good. I'd really appreciate that. Um, and then bonus, oh, not bonus, sorry. Sorry, how do you go about learning all of this? You go back in time and listen to Saskia's presentation. <laughs> Um, but my listening tool was very much the same as yours. So one-to-one -one with the team, partners, and vendors. I soon find out that I wasn't going to be able to speak to everyone in 30 days. So I thought I needed a different mechanism. So that's when I started to run retrospectives with people at different levels. And I was really, really insightful as well as quick. I also sent them a survey beforehand so I could find the themes before the retro so I could have better conversation during the retrospective which I time boxed one hour, so that was really good. Um, and then, you know, meeting regularly with the heads of design, finding data, getting involved, observing, critical thinking, all the stuff we've been talking about today. And so here's an example of the retro I ran uh, with some, some people in the team. The themes were around the ways of working, so rituals, planning, feedback, comms and collaborations, learning and careers, really important people open up a lot about this, and then our design tooling. Bonus, culture. So we talked earlier about unlearning and relearning, and that applies to the culture of the organization. So one thing you can do is find what they call in the book cultural interpreters. People who have been long enough in the business to know the stories, know the dynamics, know how decisions really are made in that organization, the unwritten rules of the organization. And this has been the most useful thing uh, I was able to do. For instance, I was speaking to my VP of people, and it was really incredible, the knowledge, the insights I gained into really how the organization worked. And there's one question that was critical. And that question that I think you can ask, even if you're in role today, when you connect, have informal chats with your stakeholders is, what's the one piece of advice you would give me? This has been so useful. The organizational wisdom I got from this single question was incredible. 
and I would ask it even now, five months in. Okay, so there I was at the end of my 30 days, and I had 10,000 words of notes. And I then, this is like when you do like your synthesis, right? So 10,000 words of notes turn into 481 stickies on Miro, which are then turned into a deck of 44 slides, which then condense to an exact summary of 10 slides. And it takes a long time and it's mentally challenging to synthesize that much information, but it's, it was critical for me because then you need to go and broadcast your point of view to your boss and to stakeholders and to the team about what you've learned and what you're going to do about it. And to this day, that deck is my Bible. I haven't done all the things or solved all the problems in there, but Last week, we talked about well, it's, you know, reigniting or you know, changing the way we do critiques. Hey, I have all the information from my listening tool, so now I don't have the bandwidth to do this, but if you want to go and do it, go and do it. I'll give you the information, and you set up for success. So I multiply myself by sharing the knowledge I gathered when others are taking initiatives to drive practice or processes forward. So. Let's talk a little bit about early wins. So this, these early wins help you build credibility in the organization and also feel good. So they're really important. For me, the three early wins were around uh, changing the cadence of meetings and rituals, uh, which we talked about this morning with Johnny. How we support people through org changes and then tooling foundations, which are the easiest of win of all if you're, you know, coming into an organization that has 50 different tools and it's wild, wild west. So, um, you know, for like the, the rituals, um, they had gone a bit by the wayside. So we got the team together uh, in person. Uh, we did a retrospective. We changed our weekly cadence, you know, uh, fortnightly cadence. We have a design strategy group. We have a design leadership group, which includes, you know, leaders at IC level. And we have a fortnightly manager meeting, so like people who manage people can connect and talk about people and processes and support each other. Uh, and then we have a weekly meeting where we share work and also have you know, updates from our VP of design or some of the central function initiatives. Um, this relates to uh, the org changes. So we have a concept at Clear Score called races. They are it's the equivalent of a quarter, but it's a 12-week period. Uh, and essentially, you know, the priorities change, and so with that, the people need to move into, you know, different squads, depending on the needs of the squad. And in the past, it wasn't really managed, and so that was generating a lot of complaints. So this time, what we did is I kind of tried to, like, lead the design like leadership team to do that properly for a series of meetings and documented along the way the process that we went through. And now at the end of it, I actually have a process that we didn't have before. So documented along the way was really important. And then we thought about, well, what makes a good transition? I had, you know, lots of inspiration because I was in a transition myself. So we said, okay, so for designers or line managers or heads, what are the des desired outcomes for this transition? How do we want people to feel? How do we, what do we want them to know? And therefore, what are the activities that we want to take? Or well, you're uh, going to have a one-to-one -one with your manager when you're moving. You're going to get some support. Um, and you're also going to communicate that to the rest of the organization. And to help you further, we also designed this transition checklist. So we had one for onboarding people into the organization, but we didn't have anything to support people moving sideways, right? So we did this, and it was incredibly useful. This is all about you know, how you hand over your work properly, uh, including you know, to the nitty gritty of sharing your Figma files, your mirror boards, any testing, user testing, documentation, uh, being invited to the rituals in the right channels, having a meeting with your head of, with your stakeholders, and so on. Incredibly useful for lateral moves. Uh, and then finally, tooling. So as we've seen, you know, simplifying the landscape from multiple tools to free strategic tools, re-onboarding them properly for the proper channels, uh, passing security assessments, legal review and contracts, um, 
and then sorting out things like license management and scheme provisioning so I don't have to s <laughs> manually manage access for or revoking access for people who leave the organization. Um, this is a baguette here because it's bread and butter. <laughs> and I'm French. Um, okay, and so now I'm at this stage where I'm uh, tackling some strategic initiatives and I can tell you more about these in the future. But really, a year on from that fateful day at Clisco, we have this wall where when you pass probation, you sign your name on the wall. <laughs> Funny story, the first day I got there, um, the uh, lady in the admin team gives us a tour of the office. And then uh, if you zoom out here, there's like a, a big like, room and you walk next to it. And so she stops and she turns around and they say, we'll tell you about this later, but um, we take probation very seriously. And I was like, shit, I've been here for like two minutes. I thought I had the job already and now I'm under pressure. Uh, okay, it's great to have this, all these like, signature and stuff, but it's a bit scary. Um, but anyway, so, you know, three months later, I passed probation and I was signing my name here and uh, doing a scribble of like the Wu-Tang logo for people who are into hip-hop. Uh, anyway, I was very grateful and uh, I'm really happy to be working in this company. It feels really good. And a big part of that was unlearning because unlearning is an essential part of evolving and evolving is an essential part of finding yourself. Thank you very much.